So, hi, I am Jennifer Tuttle. I direct the Maine Women Writers Collection here at UNE. And on behalf of the collection, our curator, Sarah Baker, and UNE, I want to welcome you all to the Donna M. Loring Lecture. Uh, I do want to begin by acknowledging that we're standing on Wabanaki land and right adjacent to their waters, home to the Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot peoples. And of course, as a settler institution in this place, we recognize that this acknowledgement should be the beginning and not the end uh, of our responsibility. So one very small but very meaningful part of that is that we've been really looking forward to celebrating Morgan Talty and his work. And that day has finally come. So I really want to thank, begin by thanking Morgan Talty for joining us. For all they've done on site to make this event happen, we also want to thank the Maine Women Writers Collection's own Laura Taylor. We want to thank UNE's Office of Communications, especially Lee Cody and Dave Diego and Milo Grammer along with UNE's housekeeping, facilities, and Parkhurst staff uh, for all they have done to make this day work. We also want to thank Elements Bookstore. Over there at the table, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, Bitterford Institution, and we really want to thank them for providing the books for today uh, that we'll be offering for sale after the reading, after which, of course, there will also be time for Morgan Talty to sign books. So if you have your book with you, you might consider lingering for that. Um, and remember that if you have a student ID, there's still a few free books over there for you. So don't hesitate to grab your copy of that. Okay, I also want to mention that we're happy to support the work of Andrea Paredes in the Office of Intercultural Student Engagement, especially their book club, who are currently reading Night of the Living Res, and I know some of the book club members are here, so welcome to you as well. I'm going to say just a few words to introduce Donna Loring first. Um, the Loring Lecture is an institution here at UNE, and... Uh, I know that she's well known to many of you, but I do want to say a few words about Donna first. Uh, as many of you know, the Honorable Donna M. Loring is a Penobscot Nation tribal elder and former council member. For 12 years, she represented the Penobscot Nation in the Maine State Legislature, during which, among many other accomplishments, she authored and co-sponsored um, LD-291, an act to require teaching Maine Native American history and culture in Maine's schools. Through this work, as well as her hosting of Wabanaki Windows on WERU Community Radio, her recent work as Senior Advisor on Tribal Affairs to Governor Janet Mills, and many other commitments, Donna Loring has devoted herself not only to public service, but to raising public awareness um, of and dismantling institutional discrimination against Wabanaki people and continuing the hard fight for recognition of their sovereignty. Her 2008 book, In the Shadow of the Eagle, a tribal representative in Maine, has been reissued this year by Down East Books. So that is still available, available and worth celebrating. She holds two honorary doctorates and has received numerous awards, including the Deborah Morton Award from UNE and the Courage is Contagious Award from the Maine School of Law. In 2009, she entrusted UNE and the Maine Women Writers Collection with her personal, professional, and literary papers and worked with us to institute the annual Donna M. Loring Lecture, a profound gift that has become an extension of her other work. So as ever, Donna, we thank you. Um, in a few moments, she's going to come up here and say, th say some things uh, to introduce our speaker, Morgan Talty. Uh, but to supplement that, I will say that he is a citizen of the Penobscot Indian Nation. Uh, as you may know, he um, is an assistant professor of English and creative writing uh, and Native American and contemporary literature at the University of Maine, Orono as well as being on the faculty of the Stone Coast MFA in Creative Writing and the Institute of American Indian Arts. His debut short story collection, 
Night of the Living Res, won the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Sue Kaufman Prize, and probably a list of prizes as long as my arm. And he, those continue now. Uh, he has published in a wide variety of venues. Many of us have read his story collection, Night of the Living Res. If you haven't, you're going to want to after today. And of course, he has a forthcoming novel, Fire Exit. And that is very exciting and maybe can say a little bit more about exactly when we expect to see that. So um, before I turn it over to Donna, I just wanted to say a couple of quick things for the audience. First of all, if you want to get up and get food, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, there will be time for some questions at the end, so hold your questions until that time, please. The reading portion will end around one, maybe a few minutes after since we started a little bit late, uh, after which there will be, as I said, a chance for you to purchase a copy of the book and have it signed. Um, we know some of you have to leave at a particular time for another class. Don't worry, just please be as quiet as you can. We won't take it personally if you leave before the event is over. And I will just remind folks that the event is being recorded and will be available on the Maine Women Writers Collection's YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. Finally, please silence your cell phones and devices. And now I would like to bring Donna Loring up. Thank you, Donna. Wow, a lot of people here today. Uh, well, thank you for, for coming. Uh, Morgan's a great draw. <laughs> uh, what I will say about Morgan is that Penobscot Nation is really proud of him. Uh, his writing, and he's basically uh, shown what the Wabanaki people, what Penobscot Nation has, has gone through. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and how it's affected our generations. And I think his writing is very important uh, to educate the general public, and not just in Maine. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a national, uh, it's nationally read, and, and again, we're really proud of this guy. And I will say that, uh, you know, it's, he is, um, it's a small world because his uh, mother's sister is married to my nephew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're kind of related, you know, extended family. So I'm, I'm not going to say much because you're here to listen to, to Morgan. So uh, Morgan, come on up. Thank you, Donna, for that. And thank you all for having me here. Everyone can hear me good? Yeah. Everyone can hear me well? Is that how you're supposed to say it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a writer, right? So I was, I, I had this all wrong. I thought I was coming here to roast Donna. Um, <laughs> and so I had like just a list of roasts, you know, ready to go, but I'll just do one. Um, you know, there's these three guys, and, you know, one of them goes, hey, did you guys hear, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records is, you know, just out in town, and they're, you know, seeing if people can break records and, and everything, and they're like, really? They're like, yeah, they're like, we should, we should try to get in there, and one of them goes, yeah, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm pretty good at math. Maybe I'm the smartest, you know, mathematician, and they're like, yeah, you are pretty, you are pretty smart at math. The other guy goes, he's, he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm a, uh, I'm the world's hardest kicker, you know, that I can just kick something as hard as I can. And they're like, yeah, you can kick stuff hard. And the third guy goes, I think I'm the meanest, you know, meanest, toughest, baddest motherfucker around. And everyone's like, yeah, we think you are too. So they go, they all go, they all go there. The guy with the mathematician guy goes in, comes out, he goes, I'm in. The guy who kicks the strongest goes in, comes out, he says, I'm in. And then the meanest, toughest, baddest motherfucker goes in and comes out and goes, who the fuck is Donna Loring? <laughs> so. Um, thank you, Donna. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd love to, um, again, thank you all for having me, and I'd love to read um, some sections from my book, Night of the Living Res, which if you've bought it, you can buy it again, because they're for sale, um, uh, or buy two. Um, 
And yeah, so I'll just start at the beginning. Um, and then at the end, I do want to read one piece um, that was published in the Georgia Review a couple years ago. They did a special um, edition on the census. Um, the theme was the census, and uh, I think it was 20, 2020, I think, in a, or something like that. And um, I wrote a piece about blood quantum, which I can explain after, but I'd like to read that too. Um, so I'll start with the book, though, the reason everyone's here. So this is the opening story, Burn, where we meet um, David, or we meet D. Um, the story is narrated uh, back and forth in time, uh, either David, who is a young boy, or the older version of him, D, who we see kind of not doing very well. And so the story opens with uh, D narrating. And so this is Burn. If I stumble, I, I apologize. This, this is the second reading I've done. All I've been reading have been the Eric Carl books. <laughs> to my to my seventh month old and like these pop up peekaboo books so like complex sentences don't work in my brain I apologize. Burn, winter, and I walked the sidewalk at night along banks of hard snow. I'd come from Rab's apartment off the reservation. Rab, this white guy with a wide mouth and eyes that closed up when he laughed, sold pot. He was all no bullshit too. I had asked for a gram, and after he weighed it and put it in a plastic baggie and held it out to me, I reached into my pants and jacket pockets looking for the cash among the cigarette wrappers and pocket knife, and he didn't believe me as I acted the part and kept saying, shit, 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 it must have fell out on the walk over here. He shook his head, took the weed out of the baggie, and put it back into his mason jar. I ain't smoking you up, he said, and so then I said, fuck you, Rab, I really did lose the money. You'll see. Watch when I come back here in 30 minutes with the money I dropped. You'll feel stupid then. He shrugged a sorry, man, and I slammed his door shut as I left. At the bridge to the reservation, the river was still frozen, ice shining white blue under a full moon. The sidewalk on the bridge hadn't been shoveled since the last nor'easter crap snow in November, and so I walked on the brute prints everyone made who walked the walk to Overtown to get pot or catch the bus to wherever it was us Skeegans had to go, which wasn't anywhere because everything we needed, except pot, was on the res. Well, except Best Buy or Bed Bath & Beyond, but those natives who had 4K Ultra DVDs or fresh white doilies had cars, wouldn't be taking the bus like me or Fellas did each day to the methadone clinic. That was another thing the res didn't have, a methadone clinic. But we had sacred grounds where sweats and peyote ceremonies happened once a month, except since I had chosen to take methadone, I was ineligible to participate in native spiritual practice, according to the doc on the res. Natives damning natives. The roads on the res were quiet, trees bending under the weight of snow, and when I, pra when I passed the frozen swamp, a voice moaned out. I stopped walking. Nothing. So I kept on going on the sparkling road until I heard it again. Who's that? I yelled. The moan came again. It was a man, somewhere in the swamp. I got closer, listening. There it was, a low and, noisy, a low and breathy noise, and with my cold ear, I followed it. The swamp was frozen solid, the snow blown in piles, and so I slid over the ice looking for the source of the noise. Moonlight, moonlight through bare tree limbs lit the swamp, and caught among the tree stumps in solid snow was a person sprawled out on the ground. He was trying to sit up but kept falling back, like he'd just done 1,000 crunches and was too sore to do just one more. It was Fellis. Fellis, I said, standing over him. He tried to sit up, but something pulled him back down. Fuck you, fella said. Help me. He groaned, shivered. He didn't say how to help him, so I had to squat down to get a better look. I flicked my lighter, and his purple lip quivered. Hurry, he said. Fellas, I said, I can't help you if I don't know what's the matter with you. My hair, he said. I looked at it with the, with the lighter's flame. Holy, I said, and I laughed. Instead of the tight braid that shined, Fellas's hair had come undone, and it was frozen into the snow. Get me out, D, he said. D, get me out. At first, I tried to pull the hair out from the snow, tried to chip the snow away, but his hair wouldn't come loose, so I yanked and Fellas screamed. Lift your head up, I said. I opened my pocket knife, and at the click of the blade, Fellas spoke. Wait, wait, he said. Don't cut it. What do you want me to do, I asked. Tell the, tell the ice to let go? Fellas spit. Go to my house and get boiling water. I closed the pocket knife. Fellas, I told him, by the time I got back here, the water would be chilled. He was quiet, as if something walked around or among us. The ice cracked and echoed somewhere in the swamp. 
The moon shone bright, and I looked. There was nobody but us. I have to cut it, I said. You ain't getting out if I don't. Fellas asked if I had a cigarette, and when I told him no, he cursed. Fucking bullshit. Fucking goddamn winner. What the fuck? I laughed. It ain't funny, D. Look, I said. You want me to cut my braid, too? Fellas took a deep breath, and he coughed, and he gagged. No, he said. Just cut it. I gotta get home. I'm sick. I opened, my po I opened the pocket knife again, grabbed his hair in a fistful, and cut. When I got through the last bit of hair, Fellas rolled over and away from where he'd been stuck. He rubbed his head like he just woke up. I helped him stand, and we slipped all over the ice on our way, home, way out of the swamp. Through dry heaves, Fellas said he'd missed the bus this morning to the methadone clinic. No shit, I said, because I didn't see him there or, on, or at the, I didn't see him at the clinic or on the bus, and he thought some booze would be good before he got sick from not having any methadone. He'd had a bit of booze left that afternoon when he decided to go see Rab to get some pot, and on the way he'd stopped off in the swamp to feel the quiet that came with too much drinking, and when he plopped down in the snow, he dozed right off. When he woke up, his hair was frozen in the snow. I got him to his mom's, Beth's, where he still lived. He walked fine by himself to the door, but I walked with him up the steps. I never thought I'd scalp a, scalp a fellow tribal member, I said. You can laugh at that. <laughs> um, Fuck off, he said. He fumbled in his pocket for his house key. You want to smoke, I asked. Didn't you listen, he said. I didn't make it to Rab's. He unlocked the door. I'll go for you, I said. Give me the cash. Fellas looked at me. Twenty minutes, I said. I'll run there and back while you warm up, warm up your pretty bald head. He gave me thirty bucks, and I didn't ask him where he got it from. Yesterday, he said he didn't have any money. Twenty bag, fellas said. And stop at Jim's and get some tall boys and a bag of chips. Any kind but Humpty Dumpty chips. Too damn salty. Down Phyllis' driveway, I imagined the look on Rab's face when I gave him the money. What'd I tell you? How about that, Graham? D, Phyllis yelled. One more thing. Bring me my hair so we can burn it. Don't want spirits after us. We're damned anyways, I said. But I guess I'll get your hair. I kept going, wondering. Hair or pot first? Pot made the most sense. It would look strange having to set the hair and ice down like a soap, soaked mop on the counter at Jim's while I reached in my pocket for Fellows' money. Jim, that old wood booger, would say, we don't take those anymore. I'd look him square in his sagging face and say, I'm not trading no hair, you old fucker. And I'd smack down on the counter a $10 bill uh, for the tall boys and chips. With the change jingling in my pocket, I'd walk to Rab's and he'd say, get that hair out of here, it's dripping on my floor. And I'd have to plop the hair on the muddy white floor in the hallway while Rab reweighed the, re the same nugs he'd weighed earlier for me. No. I'd grab Fellas' hair from the swamp on my way home, with Fellas on his unmade bed, me on a torn bean bag in the corner, each of us with a tall boy in the pot smoke haze and gray of the room. We'd keep poking and squeezing the hair, waiting for it to dry waiting to burn it. Thank you. So this next section I want to read is from the second story. Um, and it, the second story where we meet David, we meet his mom, we meet his sister, we meet his grandmother, we meet the new boyfriend, uh, we meet you know David's new friends. Um, they've just come from down south and have kind of escaped um, a not good situation, and um, and so the, this is a fresh start for them, you know, on on the Penobscot Nation. And um, I always I've read in I think maybe like f five churches total now. Um, but I went to do a reading somewhere, I can't remember where it, is, where it was in Maine, and they couldn't, the bookstore couldn't accommodate the, the people, so they moved it to the, to the church, which was right like up the road. And, uh, and uh, did you hear this story? Did I tell you this story? Oh, okay. Well, I saw you laughing, so. Um, well, anyways, I was walking down the middle section of the, the church, and I, go I get down there, and I look, and there's this table, this nice, li nice little table, and with this beautiful arrangement of flowers, and there's just like an eight by 11 size photograph of me right there. <laughs> so for e everybody, context matters. I thought I had died. <laughs> I thought I was at my own funeral. It was, ve it was very, it, 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 it really scared me a little bit. And I was like, yeah, very strange. So don't do that ever um, in a church for an author. Um, 
So this scene, um, the only thing you need to know here really is that um, David's sister has finally showed up. She's much older than he is. She's probably about 10 years older, um, and he's just a boy. You know, he's maybe be seven or eight. And um, his sister and uh, their mother got into a fight, and the mother goes in the back room and just locks herself in there. Um, and then Grammy just comes over, and like all grandmothers, they just march in the house. Um, so, and the only other thing you need to know is that David lost a toy red figurine behind the steps of uh, their house. It had kind of like the steps pulled away from the house, and it fell down. It, it, the toy fell down there. The door was open, and so Grammy came in. I hopped off the couch. Hi, son, she said. I gave her a hug. Paige turned off the sink faucet and dried her hands. When do you get here, does Grammy said to Paige, a little while ago. Grammy walked over the linoleum to with her shoes on and gave Paige a hug that said, it's nice to see you. Where's your mom, she said. She's not feeling well, Paige told her. Grammy looked up the hallway. Something she ate, Paige said. Grammy said, mm-hmm. She stood in the doorway and Paige asked if she wanted to sit down. No, no, Grammy said. I was coming to see if David wanted to go to the evening service at the church. She looked at me, and looking at me, I was compelled to say yes. She was my Grammy, after all. But I didn't want to go alone with her, not because of her, but because it was church. I'll go if Paige goes, I said. Paige dropped her head and shoulders, shook her head. She went to her bedroom and changed. And changed. Grammy's car was a puttering two-door piece of rusted metal. I thought Paige's car was bad. Grammy's car was a puttering two-door piece of rusted metal. I thought Paige's car was bad, but Grammy's was something else. The engine made this whining sound every few minutes, like a bomb siren. Her turn signals worked, but on the dashboard, it didn't say if they were on or off. So sometimes she drove for miles. She drove, uh, she drove for miles uh, with her turn signals on. Maybe she knew. Maybe she was messing with other drivers. Also, the radio turned on and off by itself, and after we drove in silence past the small health clinic and the large tin-looking community building and the tribal offices tucked behind thick pine trees and the tan brick school and the football field, we pulled into the church parking lot and the radio kicked on and blared out Meredith Brooks's bitch, and, Podge, and Paige bobbed her head, telling Grammy to turn it up, but she flicked the radio off. Michiganasu, Grammy said, this shitty thing. We got out of the car and Grammy hurried in front of us. Paige walked by my side and whispered about Gugooks, evil spirits. They follow Grammy around, she told me. That's why the radio turned on. I tried not to be scared, but I was. Paige always talked about Gugooks, and one reason why I never stayed at Grammy's house was because Paige said the house was haunted. And when I told Mom that, she said the whole island was haunted, that years and years and years ago our people used this place as a graveyard, that even late at night she heard Gugooks tapping on the walls. Mom told me not to be scared. In the church, we took our seats, and I thumbed through the Bible in front of me. Other than that, I didn't pay attention to anything, just watched people here and there, some with their eyes closed, some open. I didn't think Paige was listening either. Her head was turned sideways, eyes half open, like the priest's word was putting her to sleep. After we'd lined up to receive the body of Christ, which I wasn't allowed to ingest and instead received a pat on the head from the priest because Mom hadn't had me baptized, I turned, uh, we returned to our, seat, our seats. Paige nudged me. Grammy watched, hand on her chest, as Paige broke her cracker in half and gave it to me. It dissolved in my mouth, and it tasted like a chalky cracker that had gotten wet and had dried again. Paige saw the disgust in my face, and she whispered, It's the best Jesus could do. <laughs> Jesus made this, I said. Paige had, put her, Paige had her arms crossed. I know, right? <laughs> Grammy told us to shut the heck up. Church dragged on. When we had to kneel, we knelt. When we had to sing, we sang. When we had to pray, we prayed. Grammy probably prayed for God to forgive Paige, and Paige probably prayed for a cigarette. Me, I prayed for the safe return of my alien figure in his red spacesuit. I still felt bad that he was all alone under those steps, buried in the cold mud, and I prayed that the change in seasons would churn him out to the surface and I'd find him one day. Toward the end of the service, we knelt one last time, saying one more prayer, but I didn't pray for anything because I couldn't focus. I smelled a stinky piggity, a fart. <laughs> I had my eyes cracked open, looking, and I felt Paige looking too. We made, 
We made eye contact, and she leaned toward me. David, she whispered. She pointed at the upholstered cushioned wood we knelt on. You ever wonder why they call this a pew? <laughs> I, I puckered my lips, felt my face getting hot, and I bit my tongue, using the pain to distract me from laughing. Grammy was shit looking at us, shaking her head, and it looked like she, too, was trying not to laugh. And when Paige saw Grammy's face, Paige let out a little croak of laughter, loud enough for the priest to hear, loud enough to turn heads, loud enough for the person who ripped one to know they were caught. <laughs> All right, I think I'll do, all right, I'll do one more um, section from the book because we were at 12.36, okay. Um, so this is the blessing tobacco. So this is another story told from David's point of view. Um, and this is really about David and Grammy. There's no real context that's needed here um, at all except maybe I always do whenever whenever I read it out loud, whenever I read this story out loud, I preface it with contextually by saying this is where we start to see Grammy's mental decline with Alzheimer's. Um, because I feel like when you read it you can go back, but when you hear it you might miss something you might miss something. So um, so this is told from David's point of view. Grammy slid the pack of misty 100s across the kitchen table. Under the ceiling light, the aged spots on the back of her hand looked like sprinkles of dirt. And like the dirt, the aged spots hadn't always been there. Help yourself to a smoke, Robbie, Grammy said. I'll make us some coffee. Grammy was sick, not cough, cough sick, the way some old people got before they slid over to the other side like a pack of smokes. Well, maybe she was cough, cough sick, but not in her lungs. The cough came from her brain, from below the soft gray stuff, burrowed deep in tissue, something tickling her there in an indescribable way. And like a thick, hacking chest cough, the one from Grammy's brain was bad. Go on, Robbie, Grammy said. She poured water into the coffee maker and then dumped the old coffee grounds into the wastebasket with a thump. The lighter's in my purse. I dragged the pack to me, in the back of my hand dirtless. With my fingernails, I pulled out the cigarette. It smelled like mint and was longer than my fingers. When I put it between my lips, it dangled there, the tip of the cigarette so far away. Robbie, Grammy said, I know you do it. Mom knows you do it. The lighter's in my purse, but please don't get me in trouble. Grammy went to the fridge and opened it. Robbie had been Grammy's little brother, and he'd been dead since before us Skeegans even had rights. I never knew him. To me, he was only a relative who left young and stayed young. Little Robbie, little great Uncle Robbie, He'd been my age, 12, when the river took him, keeping him little forever. Are you hungry, Grammy said. No, I said. I'm all set, Francis. Mom had sent me down to see if Grammy needed firewood brought in. That was why I was here. And before I left, Mom told me to play along if Grammy's brain coughed. Mom didn't say brain cough, though. She said, David, if Grammy starts up, go with it. Grammy's purse hung on the side of the kitchen chair. With the misty hanging from my lips, I unzipped her purse and dug through papers, receipts, some braided sweet grass, loser scratch-off tickets. Dirt in the bottom of her purse lodged itself under my fingernails. The loose change stuck to my hand. Two times I pulled from the purse what I thought was a lighter, but was actually lipstick and mascara. I took the purse from the chair and set it on the table under the light and dug my face in there until I finally found the lighter, a purple bic. I sat back down, the cigarette filter all wet and slimy and damp in my mouth. The coffee maker gurgled, then steamed and hissed, and finally water tunneled through the fresh grounds and sputtered out and into the stained coffee pot. The lighter warmed, the lighter warmed the longer I held it, and I wondered how I should smoke or who I should smoke like. I could, maybe, smoke like my sister, Paige, cigarette always held close to her face between drags. Or I could smoke like Mom's boyfriend, Frick take tiny, tiny puffs, but expel the largest of cloud smoke. Then there was Mom, who s then there was Mom, who only lit her cigarette, took one drag, and then forgot she even held it until the ash bent, and then she flicked it, really making the ashtray. But then I realized I couldn't smoke the way they did, because I was supposed to be Grammy's little brother. Go with it, Mom said in my head. I took the cigarette from my mouth, dried the moist filter as best I could, and then put it back in between my lips. As I did with the wood stove, at home, I flicked the lighter, except instead of putting flame to birch bark or newspaper, I touched the flame to tobacco. It caught and sizzled, and smoke rose up, stung my eyes. Smoke dived down, burned my throat. Don't, don't cough, I told myself. Don't cough. 
The coffee maker stopped dripping, and then I coughed and Grammy laughed. Think you'd be used to it, Grammy said. Mom did say you were digging into the family's blessing tobacco. Said she couldn't catch it, but knew you were doing it. She was talking to Robbie, so I didn't say anything. I tried the cigarette again. It was easier on the throat, but it was coarse like swallowing sand. Misty's are my favorites, Grammy said. Harsh, but not too harsh. I agree, I said. Grammy laughed. She reached in the cupboard and took down two white mud mugs, red lipstick faintly staining the rims. Sugar, cream, she asked. Both, I told her. She fixed the coffee, set mine in front of me, and took a seat. My ash was, my ash was getting long, and so I flicked the cigarette over the ashtray. The ashes flung up and over and landed on the other side of the table, and Grammy swiped them to the floor. Grammy lit her own cigarette, took a drag, and set it down on the table, the lit end dangling off. She picked up her coffee, blew on it sharply, and sipped. I could have smoked more of the cigarette, but I butted it. I didn't even sip my coffee twice before Grammy offered, another, offered me another misty. Go on, she said. Help yourself. I'm okay, I said. My throat hurt. No, no, she said. Please, have another. No, that's okay, Francis, really. Grammy sipped her coffee and then set the mug down. Have another, she said. By the seventh cigarette, I realized Grammy was setting me up. <laughs> or setting Robbie up. I was sitting in that chair, watching Grammy grow angrier and angrier, forcing cigarette after cigarette. Smoke another, she said, after I butted each one. I was being stubborn. I could have run home. But instead, I stayed until my body couldn't take it anymore, until my head was banging and banging, until the coffee acid in my stomach begged to rise up and out. I didn't know how many I smoked, but finally I shot up, the chair tipping over, and I bolted, to the, and I bolted for the front door. That'll teach you to steal the blessing tobacco, Grammy yelled. <laughs> If you want to read the rest of that story and the other one before, there's copies over there. <laughs> um, so I'd love to just, I haven't actually like had a chance to like talk about my next book that's coming out. Um, so I have a novel coming out, uh, it's my debut novel. Um, this is called Stories. And the cool thing about writing stories and publishing them, publishing a story collection first is you get to kind of be a debut writer twice you get to have the debut story collection, and then you have the debut novel, right? But if you do it the other way, you're, you're a de your debut's done. So I, I did it this way, because I had to. Um, but the, the novel's called Fire Exit, and um, I don't know if, I don't think people can see it, but um, it, you can pre-order, it's on Amazon, I'm not trying to pitch you to buy the book. Um, but I wanted to read a, read a piece that um, I wrote for the Georgia Review that is kind of the catalyst for the story of the, of the novel, which I'll give the description of at the end. Um, so this piece uh, is called The Citizenship Question, We the People. The memory begins here. We're young, Askegians, and we're somewhere in the reservation, somewhere on the reservation, the island, we could have been anywhere, but when we look back on it, we're in the woods, alongside the dirt road that runs against the Penobscot River down to the graveyard, a dead end, unless you count the path at the end wide enough for a car to shoulder through, in which case it is not a dead end, but just a continuation to another part of this place. Again, we could have been anywhere, but we remember the sound of the water crashing in the distance, the tumultuous noise as the brown river rose, crescendoed, smashed against rock, water spilling onto the shore like a bowl filled too high and set not gently on the table. It must have been spring when the ice on the river thawed, the bowl of our world filled too high. This is before we smoked, before we stole cigarettes, before we went down to the tribal offices and dug through the ashtrays, plucking, sal plucking salvageable butts and purifying the filters with flame, calling each other on house phones to whisper, found three, let's meet up. And this is before we hid out in the woods late at night, past curfew, around a fire while we drank first one beer, stolen from an older brother or sister or mother or father, given by an older brother or sister or mother or father, and then a second and a third and a fourth and a 12 pack, a 24, a 30. And this too is before some of us went too deep, before some of us died from suicides, before some of us died from overdoses, alone in that back room, a slant of light, before some of us before some of us would keep on living, 
before some of us had children who one day will remember this, all of this, this memory, like it was them who had lived it in the before, down there in the woods along that dirt road that runs with, against, the river on down to the graveyard. Out there in the woods, we're talking about being Indian. I'm more than you, one of us says, and you and you and you. Not you, though, I don't think. Um, how much you got? This is before we know better, before we know that some will never know better. This is before we or some of us know how vast the government's plan ran, how much it festered. This is before we know these men, the so-called white fathers, had plans masked as survival but were intended for us to eat each other's spirit piece by piece. This is before colonial construct is in our vocabulary. 85%, one of us repeats, five more than me. Nobody says anything else about it, but it's there, an itch we can't scratch, or an itch that doesn't yet need a scratch. Back at, uh, but at home later, we feel it, that itch, and so we each go through the book. We all have one, or our parents do. It's a small book held together with a black binding comb, the cover showing a traditional double curve, a drawing denoting the union of tribes, the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. The pages, some dirty like the color of grease on a white cloth, are filled with a list of names organized alphabetically by family last name. Next to each name is a number, a percentage. We see ourselves, our union, blank percent, blank percent, blank percent, blank percent, and blank percent. The next day in the woods, one of us says, shit, blank is 100%, holy, poof, and blank doesn't even live here, lives over town. I don't even know who that is. His family's been on the council forever. Something's not right. The river is still loud, another day of spoilage, of draining. One of us comes back to it. How could we not? I did the math. How'd you get 85%, I want to know. They just did, one of us responds. Who? The census committee. We say nothing. Your mom was on that, wasn't she? We don't know. It's suspect, more than one of us thinks. Not all of us, though. But all of us know has... But all of us know that something has fractured. Or maybe it's just our memory of the river crashing on those slick rocks. No, because we can feel it, this breakage, each of us, a rupture. This is before we know how fractures work, that for one to occur, a force stronger than the object has to be applied. And while this is before we know what that force is, we've always known how to feel. We were born with that skill. That is our union. But do we know what was fractured? Do we know from which part the pain originated? Was it our memories, our egos, our sense of Panawapskawi, our knowing if we exist? Above all, is it, is it this fracture that has unsettled us, that pushed us on our paths into the after? This is where we split, move apart. That day in the woods, each of us off in our own directions, home, uh, directions home, again, the crashing of the river fading behind us forever there in our memory and the way back, an inner ear pressed to a shell hearing. This is where some of us will learn to hate ourselves. This is where some of us will learn to love ourselves. But I wonder, me, I, a piece splintered from that hole who remembers that day, that talk, that sound of the river's violent thrashing, will I ever know, ever figure out, if to belong here is to not belong, or if, not, or if to not belong here is to belong. So this piece was about uh, blood quantum, and all federally recognized tribes have to keep track of citizens. And all tribe, you know, before contact, tribes, no one was going around being like, hey, how much blood you got? And, you, know, you know, like that wasn't a thing. Um, and some, every, every tribe has their own way they keep, tra keep track of citizenship. Um, there are tribes out there who follow patrilineal, um, like, you know, if, if the father is native, then the children are native, or matrilineal, you know. But a lot have adopted the colonial tool of, of blood quantum, which is, you know, if you're 50% and, you know, you, you have a, a, a child with somebody who's non-native, that child is 25%, and there's always a minimum, so you need to have at least a quarter and 25% to be Penobscot, for example. Um, and, you know, I grew up with friends who were not native at all, you know, who, whose parents married in and, you know, we hung out. And I, I always was just always so curious, you know, like how, you know, you, when you turn 18, you can't live on the island anymore. You know, you, you're not, it's not your home, but yet you've lived there 
potentially 18 years. You may have been born there, right? You went to school there. Um, and so I, that kind of, it, it bothered me. You know, blood quantum bothers me. And so um, I wrote this novel, Fire Exit, um, and the book isn't about blood quantum, but it's the thing that gets the story going. Um, a, a, a man marries, a man's mother marries into the tribe, I think in the 60s, in the 1960s, before pre-settlement act, and um, he's only like one or two uh, years old, and he grows up there. Um, he faces some, you know, being white in this, you know, place, um, but he has friends, and uh, there's a girl there that's one of his closest friends, and just to, to make this short, they end up they end up uh, together, and in, in, you know when they're when they're a bit older, you know in their twenties, and she's a quarter blood, and the settlement act is passed, you know the census is in place, and all this stuff, and uh, she gets pregnant, and she tells him point blank that I am going to lie and say that this child belongs to somebody else, um, and because she wanted her child to be considered a citizen, and the narrator who kind of gets it because he spent his whole life having to be on the outside after he turned 18 was like sure okay but now time is moving forward and he's he's kind of like had enough of it and so I'll read just the synopsis of the book for you because um, I, I feel like it needs to be tweaked a bit to talk <laughs> about that part um, so and I the last paragraph I did not write okay did not write the last paragraph so fire exit. From the porch of his home, Charles the Mosway has watched the life he might have had unfold across the river on Maine's, on Maine's Penobscot Reservation. On the far bank, he caught brief moments of Roger and Mary raising their only child, Elizabeth, from the day she came home from the hospital to her early 20s. But there's always been something deeper and more dangerous than the river that divides him from this family and the rest of the tribal community. It's the secret that Elizabeth is his daughter, a secret Charles is no longer willing to keep. Now it's been weeks since he's seen Elizabeth and Charles is worried. As he attempts to hold on and care for what he can, his home and property, his alcoholic, quick-tempered and big-hearted friend Bobby, and his mother Louise, who is slipping ever deeper into dementia, he becomes increasingly haunted by his past. Forced to confront a lost childhood on the reservation, a love affair cut short, and the death of his beloved stepfather, Frederick, in a hunting accident, a death that he and Louise cannot cannot agree where to lay the blame, Charles contends with questions he's long been afraid to ask. Is it his secret to share? And would his daughter want to know the truth? From award, I didn't write this part. From award-winning author of Night of Living Res, Mor Morgan Talty's debut novel, Fire Exit, is a masterful and unforgettable story of family legacy, uh, of family legacy, bloodlines, culture, and inheritance, and what, if anything, we owe one another. And so this book will be published June 4th, 2024, and you can pre-order it. I will shut up. Yeah. Thank you. So we want to do a Q&A. Is that? Um, so where did you go to high school? I went to Orono High School. OK. So how did that, <clears throat> how did you mix with the white people? Um, was there a prejudice? Um, not really at Orono. Um, Old Town more so, I think, because um, Donna might have a better sense of how it how it worked. But when when I when I graduate, because the school on the island goes up to eighth grade, and so when you graduate, you have to go off the island to go to high school. And there's uh, when I graduated, we could choose to go to either Old Town, Orono, John Baps, or Bangor. I think was that the case then yeah um and we as as like my class you know we did a lot of stuff in, in old town we used to go to the ymca like dances you know we'd go to the skate park there and stuff like that and all of them knew we were from the island and so we'd get shit sometimes from them um there would be fights and that sort of stuff um <clears throat> growing up but when we Somehow, mo most of my class chose to go to Orono, and it's, it was a, s a little bit smaller than Old Town. And there really, there I never experienced any um, any racism from anybody. I think they may have been 
scared of us. I don't know because we we roamed we roamed the hall in packs in packs <laughs> of, of, of Penobscot and you know a couple of Passamaquoddies who were down that way. Um, but no, they I don't know they were. I met some you know not great people you know there um, that I still talk to to this to this day. But yeah, it, I, we weren't spit on or anything like that. Because uh, I moved to Bangor in 1973 from Boston, uh, and I never heard any anti comments wherever I lived. I grew up in upstate New York. And when I arrived at Bangor, I couldn't believe uh, the comments made by educated people, lawyers, yeah. doctors, and uh, you know, cops sometimes, yeah. and, uh, and maybe things you know evolved, but it was worse than you know the way people in South Boston sometimes talked about African Americans. Yeah. Uh, so where did you go to college? Uh, so I went to Eastern Maine Community College for three years, and then I transferred to Dartmouth College, which has like a, a very large Native population there, because the school was founded for the education of um, Native youth, although that was never promised until <laughs> 1970. Um, yeah, they just basically stole the money to build the college for white non-Natives. But um, so that's where I went to. That's where I got my undergrad and my MFA at uh, the University of Southern Maine. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much um, for reading for us today. I was really inspired to hear your inspiration for your upcoming book um, and, and thinking about the meaning behind that and how you wove that into a story. And I'm wondering, I might have missed it because I was a tiny bit late, but if you could share um, that inspiration for the book that you read from mostly for the um, oh night of the living res night of the living res yeah could you share kind of your drive or inspiration for writing those stories yeah um, really it was um, it was a long story and then there's a short story um, the short story of it is I went between my undergrad years and then getting my MFA I had written short stories. Um, that had featured David as a character. The very first story I ever wrote, uh, not that, that I ever wrote, but the very first story in that sort of like era around 2016, 2015 was actually Night of the Living Res, which is the title, which is the title story, which comes second to last in the book. And um, then I wrote some other stories like Smoke's Last, which is in the book as well. I wrote um, a couple others that were failed stories that ultimately became versions that were in the book. Um, but when I went into my MFA program, you have to do a project, you know, a, a, a creative thesis. So um, I was like, well, I'll do short, I'll do short, short stories. I already have some. And um, really, that was the inspiration was like, I wanted to write a short story collection. But the first draft, just to make it short, it was terrible. It was neither like, like, it was the same, it was just David. It was only David for 10 stories, and it was him just getting progressively older and older and older. And it was like reading just the same thing over and over and over again. And then I heard this story about this native guy who got, who did get actually get his hair frozen in the snow because he, he passed out drunk. And this non-native guy found him and cut cut his hair and, um, and <laughs> And the guy and the guy telling the story was like, yeah, I was, I was standing, you know, looking over my shoulder, you know, cutting this Indian's hair off, <laughs> and you know, and and it was just such a f contradictory sort of like paradoxical, you know, it just it was like this timeless thing. I couldn't make sense of it, so I tried to write it as an essay, but it wouldn't work as an essay because I was so far removed from the story. So I wrote uh, what became Burn. And I had stopped writing my story collection. I was like, that's done, that's done for. Um, but I had written David's voice for so long. And there's a, a one line in, the, in Burn that says, um, fella says, get me out, D, fella said, D, get me out. And I knew when I was writing that story that I had to say the narrator's name for rhythm purposes. Like I just knew it had to, uh, he had to say the name. And I was, and I wanted to say David, but I'm like, this isn't David, this is something different. I've moved on from that project. 
And I put it off for as long as I could until I had to actually name the character. And I would, just, like, convinced it started with D. It was like Darren, I don't know, Darius, some, you know, it's something. And I kept saying D over and over and over again until eventually D sounded like a name, which it is, you know. And I typed two E's after it, and I was like, oh, that's his name. And I was like, wait a minute. And I was like, is this like a nickname for David? You know, like, is this David much older? And like, I had stopped resisting that idea. And then this question emerged, which was, which was what happened? You know, how did we get from this good natured boy to this estranged young man who has, you know, who's a drug addict, who is on methadone, who is disconnected, his family is nowhere to be seen in, in these, in these D narratives. Um, and that was really the inspiration then. Like, that's when it kicked in. Is like, I wanted to know what happened to this family. Um, and, you know, you, I, I think, you know, when you read the story collection, the stories stand alone. Um, like, you can read one, like the Blessing Tobacco, you could read, and, and, and that's it. Um, or if, if you read the whole book, you end up having, like, a cohesive narrative. And, like, that's what I wanted. I, I wanted to do something like that. And there are books out there that do that. Um, Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad is a, is a good example. Um, Louise Erdrich's first, no, I don't know what, um, Love Medicine was sold originally and marketed as a story collection, but now it's marketed as a novel because novels sell and story collections don't. Um, that's literally the, the truth. Um, but uh, so that's sort of the, that was the inspiration behind writing that. And plus, I just didn't know what else to do with myself. I, I, I don't want to, like, s sit behind a desk all day. I just, well, not, that's weird, because I write and do sit behind a desk. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to sit behind a desk and do other people's stuff for them, so to speak. I'd rather just do my own. Um, I was just curious, were the characters in your book, are they based off of people that you grew up with or knew or knew of? Um, like, did you know, like, is there something that you grew up with that's similar to David or, like, the other characters in your book? Or did you just, like, make them up and design them yourself? It's a great question. Um, I think for the, for, the, for the David stories, I feel like those are very closely aligned with my own, my own family. Um, just because before I started writing this book, um, I, I was a nonfiction writer. I wrote memoir. That, that's how I, that's, that was my approach into writing is I wrote memoir. Um, but then I got to this point where I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this actually happened? So I started to gravitate towards fiction because I, I started to see these possibilities. And so it, over years and years of just writing various, you know, stories, nonfiction and, and, and fiction, um, my fiction began to have this character David, and and I, I feel like it's part of me in in a way in that in that sense. Um, and um, like JP and, and Tyson, um, if those two people that they're based off, they'll read they read the book. They'll know who they are. <laughs> um, um, the Fellas and D stories um, are, are all made up. The, those characters are completely not based off of anybody. But every character, I feel like, is an amalgamation of, of who we of who we are. Not necessarily who we're thinking of, but what happens if we put these type these three people together, right? And like put them as one person. Um, so half the book is kind of like autobiographical in some aspect, but then the other part isn't. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm a president of Creative Writing Club and we have some of our members here today. Do you have any advice for young writers, just in general? Thank yeah, you. Don't, don't quit, okay? <laughs> like, you cannot quit writing. Um, I can't stress this enough. I wrote, it took me, I started writing when I was 18 and I didn't get a, my first story accepted until I think it was like nine years I had spent submitting stories, right? And it's very easy It's very easy to get disheartened, I think, with anything that we're trying to do artistically. And in, in, in any sort of artistic community, I also think that there's this saying, you know, oh, this, this fails, like this doesn't work, right? Like this, this fails. I, my attitude has changed from thinking about work that fails rather than seeing it as just you're walking still, you're, you're on a path, right? Like, 
a story in here, food, food for the Common Cold, I wouldn't have written that story if I hadn't written an, a 30-page story before that didn't work. Because writing that 30-page story that didn't work, that was unpublishable, that was just garbage, led me to an interesting thing like that I couldn't see before. We write to figure out stuff. Like that's, that's why we write. And so my advice is to don't quit, is to keep going. Because if you do quit, you're not going to find what it is you're looking for. If you wait for inspiration to hit, it's not going to all the time. You know, you have to just sit down and do it even when you don't want to. Um, and so that's my advice, is just to, to keep going and develop the thick skin. And when people say no, I every, this is really petty, but um, every agent who declined my book um, who would represent it to sell it to publishers. I put them on a specific email list, so whenever the book wins awards or anything, it, go, it, go, it, go, it, go, it, go, it goes to them. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting, because I went to Barnum's & Noble for this prize I was a finalist for. I didn't win it. I should have. Um, no, um, I saw a lot of agents there who had said no, about, no to my book, and it was funny to see their, their faces, but... Um, yeah, that's my advice, is to, to, to stick with it and be petty, petty I guess. <laughs> yeah. I was in a big auditorium once, and they had one mic, and there was just this, this one woman who was, like, sprinting, just, you know, and it was bigger than this, like, a lot bigger. So I think probably this will be the last question we have time for, so you have plenty of time to answer it, and then you still have time to sign your books. Okay, is that perfect. okay? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you for your reading and for your book. Uh, I was struck when I read it about how you treated um, substance use. And it was just like a bedrock reality. And it was, a, it was very intriguing to me how you treated it. And I wonder if you could expand on that, that choice. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I grew up surrounded by substance abuse. Um, you know, my, you know, my mother, my sister, my father, um, my neighbors, you know, um, it was always there, you know, it was, it, it was, it was there, there was no escaping it, um, you know, I remember, you know, I s started smoking mm -hmm. cigarettes when I was like 12, you know what I mean, I started drinking when I was, you know, 14 or 15, you know, and it was just, it was there, it was, it was, it, 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 you could access it in some way, and um, it was just a big part of my life, and I fortunately, you know, I don't, I don't smoke anymore, I don't drink, um, you know, I don't do drugs or anything, um, I, fortunately, my sister always says to me, she's like, she's like, I don't know how you managed to get out of this, this cycle of our family problems and um and I don't either I don't I don't know um it just I guess I got lucky or, or something um but it, it's it had just been such a big issue in in my family that there was no escaping not writing about it and I feel like people what bothers me the most about substance abuse is it's like people People treat it like it's, like it's it's a chronic illness. Substance abuse is a chronic illness. It's not like, it's not like a, a common cold. You know what I mean? Like once you, you once you are an addict, it is something you live with for the rest of your life, right? Just because I don't smoke cigarettes anymore, just because I don't drink anymore, I'm still an addict in that sense, right? And people like to think, oh, okay, he's better. We can leave them alone now. You know what I mean? And the sense of community that we build around substance abuse starts to fall away. Or we just kind of don't deal with it in general. You know, we shove people aside. And with this book, I was like, I want to show the ways in which people can be there for each other when there are problems. Because D really has nobody except his other, you know, friend who is also a drug addict, right? But it ultimately ends with, you know, him coming back to his mother and his mother, you know, taking care of him in this, you know, this, this reuniting sense. And I don't know, I just think we're not, treating, we're not treating addiction and mental illness the right way 
is all. I'm not a clinician at all, so I'm not, I don't have like any research I can pull out of my pocket right now to give you, but um, I wanted to just approach it as honestly and as raw as I could. You know, like this is, this is how I saw it. You know, this is how I experienced it. Um, and it, it still hap happens to this day, you know. And the other thing I also want to mention too is, you know, this book is just a slice of the Penobscot Nation not everybody's, you know, on methadone, you know what I mean? Um, I'm, me, I'm just, I'm waiting for the next Penobscot writer to write a book that's like an antithesis to this book, you know, because that's, that we, that's what we need. We need these conversations that are similar, but we also need the conversations that are different because that's the only way we're ever going to find any type of truth, any type of reconciliation between what's going on, what's going wrong, and what's going right, so... I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody.